Welcome to uh, Checking the Chains at the Gate. We're gonna talk about how we can build supply chain security policies using Gatekeeper and a project called Ratify. My name is Jeremy. Um, this is probably my favorite contribution to Kubernetes. Uh, it's my cat with a laser background. He was the 120 release mascot. Uh, I was the 120 release lead, so that was the fun perk you get for being release lead. You get to come up with a, a fun mascot. I'm also a, t a chair in SIG release, and I'm also on the Kubernetes Code Conduct Committee, so you may know me from one of those things. Uh, in my day job, I am uh, an engineer on the Azure Container Upstream team, and we are really focused on making sure that open source and Microsoft have a good time together, spe specifically around containers. Um, we're looking at things in the supply chain security space and making sure that um, we are doing good things with open source and helping open source uh, be successful as well. Before we get going, let's kind of take a moment to pause and reflect on the state of building and shipping services and, and software today. It's pretty good. There's a lot of tools that we can use, a lot of languages, um, a lot of frameworks that we can take dependencies on to just satisfy the, the needs and allow us to focus on business use cases, right? We don't have to go and reinvent the wheel all the time. Sometimes we do, but not all the time. Uh, and, and generally, it just makes things faster. Um, the downside to that is that there's a lot of things. Uh, there's a lot of complexity to worry about. Building services is, is easier than it probably has been in a long time, but operating those services and knowing what's running in different places is a little more complicated than it used to be. As we start building microservices and, and shipping things to more and more clusters and different clouds, it's really difficult to kind of understand what am I doing in cloud A and cloud B? What's the skew I've got between those things? How do I keep track? How do I enforce uh, that we're, we're doing things consistently across those things? And to make matters worse, a lot of governments are helping us by making new regulations and directives that we have to comply with. Uh, the EU, uh, this is an example, uh, has, has mandated that people start to produce S-bombs. The US government has done the same thing. Um, we at Microsoft have had to react and start to build S-bombs for Windows. Like think about the, the complexity that comes into that. And all of that happens on top of the existing complexities and the, the difficulties we have with, with everything that we already have to deal with. And to make this problem better, we've added new tools. So instead of just that one S-bomb thing, maybe we've got two tools or we've got a, a series of frameworks that are coming to help us take that requirement and turn it into reality because things don't magically appear by themselves. How do we take all that stuff and actually make it useful? If we're just building uh, an S-bomb and storing it somewhere, does it really satisfy that requirement we saw earlier? That requirement was we need to produce S-bombs. We need to produce bills of materials so that customers can have better visibility into what we're building. They, they can make decisions. They can have a better understanding of what vulnerabilities might be in that software. And if we're just producing this thing and then maybe sticking it on a website or sticking it in a SharePoint site or a shared drive, how do we, is that useful? I, I think for these things to become the, the tool that they're intended to be, we really need to start looking at automation and figuring out how we can make automated decisions about these things. You know, maybe the SBOM declares that there is something bad in it and we, we no longer wanna use that. We need to be able to do that in an automated way, not with a Excel spreadsheet that has 7,000 tabs for all the clusters that we're running. So that, with that in mind, how do we enforce things in clusters? How do we define policies and, and control what we're gonna do? So we're at KubeCon. Let's kind of scope this down to what we can do within our Kubernetes clusters themselves. Things like our cloud provider services, those are out of our control, but we can control what's in our clusters. So what do we do, how do we approach this? If you're using Kubernetes 126 or later, like the, the cell ad, um, admission policies might be a really good way for you to start to build policies and apply those to your clusters. You can declaratively um, make policies and to say, I want uh, this, pod to have certain labels or uh, things can only come from certain registries. It's really useful to declaratively say uh, how you want things to look coming into the cluster. But those things are limited because they're running kind of in process, right? You, you're limited in what you're able to do. You can't reach out to external data sources. You can't do really complicated things with them. So an answer to that might be to use admission controllers. And admission controllers have been around for quite a while. Uh, if you haven't heard the term before, uh, what they basically allow you to do 
is to hook into the, the flow. So you, you type kubectl apply or kubectl create for a resource, it's gonna go through a flow. And the controllers can plug into two spots within that and they can change the request so you can mutate um, or, you know, your pod definition maybe to, to rewrite to a different registry or to set a default number of replicas or add labels, maybe billing information for a, a team that's gonna deploy. And then you can also validate those requests. So as it comes in, you can say, you're deploying out of a GCR registry. We don't wanna use public internet, uh, let's block that. So it gives you that kind of hook to be able to do that. But the downside is that you now have to write or run some component in your cluster as well that you know, is just another piece of complexity. Uh, all these things we're gonna, we're gonna work on um, evolving uh, to, to, to satisfy these requirements, but there's gonna be some trade-offs. So are there pieces of software that we can use to plug into those spots? And it turns out there are. There's a bunch of really great projects in the ecosystem, but we're gonna focus on uh, OPA Gatekeeper and start from there. Uh, there are alternatives. You can take a look at Keyverno or SigStore's policy controller. Um, but OPA, I think, is uh, Gatekeeper is a really great project, uh, and it has a cool story that we're going to see kind of unfold through this. So how does Gatekeeper work in that scenario? So Gatekeeper is based off of Open Policy Agent, and Open Policy Agent uses a declarative language called Rego. So you can write policies in Rego and then have that applied in either of those kind of phases of the of the emission flow into this cluster. And that works by introducing a couple of, of new concepts. So we have constraint templates and constraints. And you can think of these as new resources that Gatekeeper is gonna add into your cluster that allow you to define those policies and then apply those policies to certain sets of resources. So let's take a look at a constraint template first. The constraint template allows us to kind of define parameters, um, what things we want to include in our policy, what data do we want to use as configuration. So we've got a schema here uh, that defines a parameters field with a label underneath of that that's going to be an array of strings. So in this case, we're going to look at how we can apply um, required labels or require labels on, on things coming into the cluster. So our parameter is probably going to be a, an array of those required labels, right? I, I think that is pretty straightforward. Once we have that, then we are gonna define the actual policy itself. So in this case, we're gonna take that object that's coming in, that's under review, and we're gonna get all of the labels out of it. So in a Kubernetes resource object, there's always a metadata section. The metadata section has labels. So you can write a pretty standard line here that says, in that object, give me all of the labels from the metadata section. Once you have that, you can get that parameter that we defined which is gonna be those required labels, and you can compute the difference, right? So if we take the required and the, the provided and there's any difference, then we can generate um, a status message or an error that says, you did not provide all of the labels that are required. And then Gatekeeper can evaluate that policy and say, I don't wanna admit this into the cluster because it's, it's, uh, it's gonna violate that. So once you've defined the template, then you can define an actual constraint. So we wanna apply this to namespaces. So our use case here is all the namespaces in our cluster have to have a set of required labels. In this case, it's just gonna be gatekeeper, simple, but it's going to match anything that's coming in that's creating a new namespace. Okay, so let's see what that looks like in action. So we're going to, oops, did not play. Let's see if it plays. It was? Oh, okay, there it goes, cool. It's not showing up on my, uh, my speaker view, that's why. Okay, so we have that constraint template and the constraint itself defined. We're gonna apply those into the cluster next. So we're gonna use kubectl to do that, and that'll be in just a second. So uh, once we've applied that, can we make a namespace? That's kind of the question that we're gonna answer. So we're gonna apply those things. So we're gonna do our kubectl apply with the constraint template and the constraint. That's gonna configure Gatekeeper. Gatekeeper's already been loaded into the cluster behind the scenes, um, not super, super useful. Now we can use kubectl apply to try to create that namespace itself and we can see we get an error back that um, we don't have the required labels. We have to provide the label Gatekeeper. So that's, that's pretty nice, right? We can apply that policy and it's good to go. But as we're starting to think about policies, especially in the supply chain space, um, I think things are gonna change over time. If, if you've ever run a vulnerability scanner on something, uh, what you get today is gonna be different than what you get tomorrow. So a useful feature might be to not just look at things that are coming into the system, but maybe audit things that are in the, the cluster already. That's something you're not gonna be able to do um, 
with something that doesn't know how to do auditing, but Gatekeeper luckily does. So Gatekeeper allows us to do auditing. So we can apply our policies to the cluster and if auditing is enabled, then it's gonna go through on a periodic basis and look and see uh, how do the things that are in the cluster now line up with what's defined in the policy. So we'll get an audit timestamp. We can see when the last audit happened and kind of use that in two ways. One, we can look and see, do we need to make tweaks to our policies and uh, w will things get blocked that we don't wanna get blocked? But also it'll give us a, a good awareness of how things have drifted from what that policy might look like. So in the case of our namespaces, this is my kind cluster and I applied that policy after the kind cluster came up and obviously kind is not gonna add the gatekeeper label to all of the namespaces that I have in the cluster. So here we can see that all of those existing namespaces now would vi violate that, that policy and would either need to be remediated or we'd need to tweak the policy to exclude a, a few things. So that's pretty cool, I think. I think you can get to this point where you're labeling things automatically, you're enforcing that policy that you, you have decided that makes sense for you. But that's really working on things that are in the cluster. And I think for our supply chain use cases, that's gonna be a little hard to do. Are we going to take all of our S-bombs and load them into the cluster as, as some custom resource? Uh, that's probably not gonna happen. So how do we deal with things that are not in the cluster themselves? And what kind of use cases do we think might be necessary there? So maybe we wanna validate the integrity of images. We wanna make sure that the image that we pushed as part of our release pipeline is what we think it is, or what we thought it was uh, at the time that it was published. So maybe we wanna do verification of the images. Maybe we want to take those S-bombs and block deployments based off of their contents. Maybe we know that log4j was used uh, back in 2021 and it had a bad version. Um, how can we use an SBOM to kind of remediate that situation? So maybe we want to do that. And then finally, maybe we want to leverage vulnerability scans. Maybe we have a nightly process that goes through and scans all the images that we are using in production and attaches a serif report uh, out of trivia or something that has all the vulnerabilities that have been identified. And then we want to block anything or maybe audit everything that has critical vulnerabilities um, that, that align with our compliance requirements. So to do that, we're obviously going to need some pieces of external data. Those aren't gonna be defined in the pod spec, right? They're not gonna be part of that core custom, or that core Kubernetes resource that's gonna be part of the admission flow. So to do that, we already know we're using Gatekeeper, and luckily Gatekeeper has this really cool feature called external data. So your scenario is probably like this. You have a cluster, Gatekeeper's running inside of it, and an admission request comes in. In that admission request, there's some data that you can make decisions on, but now we want to go and do those external cool supply chain security workflows. So what we need to do is figure out how to plug that into Gatekeeper, and Gatekeeper does that with external data, and you do that by creating and registering providers in your cluster. So provider is going to be that specific piece of functionality that knows how to go and do something else aside from what's in that, that request. You know, it might query a service or it might pull some data down from somewhere else from your secure data location source that's off to the side. So what will happen is when that request comes in, you've defined a policy that says, use external data to get uh, an answer based off of the data that I'm gonna send to you. So the flow looks kind of like that. Your request will go out to the provider and then the provider is gonna talk to your external data source and then say, yes, this is good or no, this is bad. It's gonna make that decision and return that back to Gatekeeper so that it can evaluate the rest of the policy and figure out what needs to happen from there. And that looks pretty similar to any other policy. Uh, you just need to specify ex that you're, you're gonna use external data, which provider you wanna use. So you can have multiple of these things set up and then what you wanna send to it. So we're going to, in this case, uh, grab all of the containers and the images um, in the containers from this, this template. So this is probably a deployment or something that has a, a, a deployment te template inside of it. Once it gets all those images back, it's gonna send that to the external data provider. The external data provider will do the thing that it needs to do and return you back an answer, a response. And then you can take that response and figure out, was this successful, was it a failure, what do I do in the next step? And encode all of that into your policy. Okay, so now we know we're gonna use Gatekeeper. We know that external data allows us to reach out and touch some other service that's not maybe in the cluster. But how do we get those things? What, how do we distribute 
those SBOMs? How do we distribute the signatures, the, the, vulner the vulnerability reports, or anything else? Like, this is a, a space that's gonna keep emerging and changing, um, and new things are gonna unfold all the time. So I think one way would be to, to put those into a file service, right? You could maybe put them in a, a, a blob storage in your cloud provider and query things and, and find them. That's a fine way, but how do you associate those things with the images that are coming in? So you are gonna deploy your application, it's got two containers. Those two containers have SBOMs associated with them or signatures, how do you know which one is which? Well, in the new version of OCI 1.1, which is gonna be approved hopefully soon, uh, there's a new API called refers, and refers allows you to say object A, object B have a relationship, and then you can kind of query that directed graph. And a fun fact is that you can use OCI registries to store other things, so it's not just images. If you're using Helm, maybe you've pulled Helm charts from an OCI registry. Uh, Flux does that as well. You can store Flux things and pull them from, from OCI registries. If you've used SigStore, they are now storing signatures in registries. Um, you know, when you co-sign something, the signature ends up in the registry and uh, you, can, you can find it that way. The refers API takes that like to the next level so you can store all kinds of things and associate them together. So you get this nice graph of say object, maybe my container, SBOM, and uh, maybe a signature. And the way that that ends up working is that you get, hopefully in a registry near you soon, um, you get your image, right? So we've made this image index that has an AMD64 image for, for our, our internal application. And we then create a new artifact just another thing that we're gonna store in the registry for our SBOM. There we go, so we, we use an image manifest to create that new SBOM. The really, really critical thing for this workflow to work though is that subject block that's at the bottom. That subject block is gonna refer back to the thing that it's describing or that it's related to. So if it's a signature, that signature is gonna refer back to the container. Uh, it could be a signature that refers back to an SBOM. The really cool thing that you can do here is that you can have that graph walk down several levels, and we'll see that in just a second. It's gonna refer back to that, and then the referrers API will allow you to do those queries and say, for this given um, image, which is SHA-256-4413, oh, sorry, uh, SHA-256-8920-53, et cetera, give me all of the, the objects that refer to that, and it'll give you back that whole collection. And you can filter it down later, and you can say, give me all of the SBOMs that refer to that, and, and pull those down as well. So we know that OCI is gonna be useful here. Let's take a look at maybe a notional application, how this might work for folks. And this is gonna be a really simple, one single container application, but we've decided that we are gonna sign it and we're gonna produce an SBOM and we wanna publish that SBOM. So it's gonna be that kind of complete workflow. And to do that, we've enabled our teams through a reusable GitHub workflow that installs all the tools and then signs with cosign and also signs with a new tool called notary or no notation that allows us to do slightly different things. And then we're gonna generate an SBOM and attach that to the thing as well. So we should end up with an SBOM and two signatures. And what that'll look like in the, in the registry once we've published that is a little something like this. Okay, there it goes, it's playing, cool. So we're gonna look at the registry first. So I have an ACR instance. Uh, I snagged KubeCon EU. I couldn't believe that that was not taken. Um, but so now I have KubeCon EU.AzureCR.io, it's super cool. And in that registry, we can see there are three things. The first one is our image, and then the second two are the signatures. The .sig is the cosine signature. It uses um, their tag kind of triangulation to figure out how to relate things together. And the second one is the notary image, and it's using the referrers API. So now we're gonna use a tool called ORAS to kind of look at what that tree looks like. I said it's a directed graph. Let's see what that kind of looks like. So we're gonna use the ORAS discover tool and use the image. We know that it's the SHA-0, or sorry, D09925. So cool, we see the SBOM and the signature. Those are both of the things that are attached with the OCI spec. So now that we have that thing published and we kind of know the structure, we know that we're using OCI artifacts to relate those things together, how do we write policies for that? Well, we know we're gonna use Gatekeeper, we know we're gonna use external data, so we're gonna need a provider. We're gonna write our policies to send images to that provider. That provider is gonna do the things that it needs to do with our supply chain security artifacts. But what's that provider gonna be? Do we have to write that ourselves? And the answer is no. There is a project called Ratify uh, that is specifically built to be an external data provider for Gatekeeper that knows how to do things with OCI artifacts 
and refers and supply chain security artifacts. It's really basic in the sense that it is just a binary and you use this binary locally. It's pretty cool. You can validate things on your machine. You can test configurations without having to have a Kubernetes cluster, without having to have Gatekeeper set up in that whole workflow. You can have an image and you can validate that image with Ratify and, and configure the policies how you need them and then deploy that to your cluster. It also runs as an HTTP service so that it can plug into that um, Gatekeeper external data flow, um, but it, it works pretty well. And the way that it works is providing a framework and then a set of pluggable verifiers. And the verifiers have a really simple interface. Can I verify this thing? And then verify this thing. And they get, you can see in the signatures, these um, OCI spec references. So it's gonna get a descriptor. The descriptor is gonna have the media type, or the artifact type, um, and then it's gonna have the referrer or the subject of the thing that it's referring to. So it can go and do that kind of triangulation and figure out what it needs to do and, and pull the things down. So you could build a ton of cool functionality into these plugins. Gatekeeper, or sorry, Ratify has a few of these already, and we'll take a look at them now. So first, we said that we signed those images with Cosign. So let's use this Cosign verifier. So we can see in plugins, under verifier, we have Cosign, right? It's gonna apply to vend dev cosign artifacts.sig version one. And then we make a policy that says we wanna apply this to any of those objects. So anything that's in the, in the request that has that type, we're gonna apply this to it. You could write some filtering and some customization there as well to tailor it down, but we're, we're gonna apply it to everything. And let's take a look what that looks like. So first we're going to use cosign to verify that this is actually a valid image. So we're going to use the cosign tool. Um, we're gonna give it that reference and configure it. This is using brand new version of cosign, so I have to give it a couple of extra options. But when we do that, um, we want to ass assert that this thing was signed by our GitHub workflow. And we use that as the, uh, the authority that we wanted to sign against or to verify against. And that worked. So that's cool. We know that the image signature was valid. It's successful. Now we would expect Ratify using that other configuration to do the same thing for us behind the scenes. So we're going to run the Ratify command directly. You can see that. And it returns back that verification report. So we can see is successful true. In our policy, we're probably going to write uh, some rules to say if the verification result is true, go ahead and send that across. Now we can do the same thing with Gatekeeper. In this case, we'll use notation just to show the difference, but here, again, we have an external data policy. It's going to use that external data provider, which is Ratify. We're going to send it the images, and then we're going to apply it to pods in this case. So like the last one we saw, we used namespaces, right? We wanted to verify the labels. In this case, we're going to use pods. So we want to make sure that all the pods that are coming in in the default namespace have signatures associated with them. And that looks a little something like this. So we're gonna take uh, our existing application and then some random internet thing we pulled down from web and networks. We're gonna try to run those things. So we'll kubectl run that first and we can see that the first one was, was uh, rejected because verification failed. That image was not successfully passed through our policy. The second one is going to be that image that we published to kubeconeu.azurecr.io that went through our whole release workflow and has all of the signatures and stuff attached to it. So here we go. We're going to run that. Uh, oh, I spelled something wrong, so I have to go back and, and fix the spelling. Even in recorded demos, I messed up. Okay, so it's going through that workflow now. And cool, we see pod created. Um, it did not fail. It didn't get rejected by that workflow. So. Those are two real simple use cases, right? Those are built-in functionalities that, that Ratify has by default. Um, what if we want to do something more complex? What if we want to, uh, to wrap a salsa verifier? We've produced salsa provenance for our build, and we want to verify that before we admit things into the cluster. Or maybe we want to use Tribi um, to scan an image, or maybe we want to parse through the serif result from a previous Tribi run. Maybe we want to invoke some artisanal tools we have internally, or we have some, uh, some government compliance things that we need to run and validate before we can finish uh, deploying into a cluster. And the way we're gonna do that is by building a custom verifier plugin. So those things are built in, uh, the cosine verifier, the notation verifier. What we're gonna do now is take a look at what it looks like to build and, and deploy a custom verifier. So in this case, what we wanna do is block licenses that we know are bad for, for our business, maybe like uh, AGPL. And then we also know that there are certain packages J, uh, log4j as a good example, um, that we just don't want to allow into the cluster because we know they're bad. So let's go take a look at what that looks like. I'm going to jump out of here 
And I'm going to change my display settings just so it looks better for everybody. OK. So in VS Code, what we're going to do is take a look at, if I can find VS Code. Oh, yeah. Here we go. I'm trying to find VS Code. There we go. OK. So let's make that bigger. So what the plugins do um, is implement a really simple interface. They are implementing that ver can verify and verify you know, those functionalities. But in the end, they're really just binaries. So they're a binary that Ratify will know how to, to, to load because you're going to give it this configuration. So we have a name for the verifier that we want to use, the things that we want to verify against. So just like in that config file we saw for the cosine verifier, or for um, we, we said that we wanted to use that cosine signature format. In this case, we're going to use application slash spdxjson because that's what we published the sbombs as. And then we said that we wanted to use um, certain licenses as things we want to disallow, and then we want to have certain packages as things we want to disallow in the cluster. So we'll provide those things as parameters here. That's what that spec configuration is going to look like. But the really, really cool thing in here is that we specify what the source for this plugin is. And that plugin itself can also be an OCI artifact, which could have signatures on it, could have SBOMs on it. So you can extend this out all the way through that kind of long tail of this, this whole workflow. So what we're going to do is we're going to build and publish a plugin. We have one written already. It's pretty simple. We'll take a look at it. But we're going to publish it to this ACR instance, which is the same one we've been pulling our images from. And then we're going to register it in the cluster using this CRD definition. So we're going to create a new verifier. Ratify will take it and run with it. What that thing looks like, um, obviously, we want to define what the parameters look like here, that kind of schema. So we've got a, a pretty simple set of structs in here, our plugin config. It has a name. It's got disallowed licenses, which is just a slice of strings. And then some packages, which is a slice of a package type that has a version and a, license, uh, a name. So pretty basic configuration. And then in the main, um, the important things to see in here are that we're going to do that verify reference that method, right? That's the, the contract that we have to satisfy. And at the bottom, we're going to just basically loop through and look for all of the bad packages. And if we find those bad packages, we're going to generate an error message or a status message to send back to Ratify. So basic, simple code. Uh, let's take a look at what building that looks like. So I'm going to go back over here. To Here's my package, or my project, right? So I've got my YAML file that we're going to deploy in just a second. I've got my code. Let's, let's build it. Let's see if this works. I like doing live things. OK, so we're going to build this. Um, I'm a, on a Mac, obviously, so I need to make sure this is a Linux image, because Go is going to build it as a, a Darwin uh, binary by default. And we're going to disable Cgo, because this is going to run in a distro list container later. OK, cool, that's done. So now what we're going to do is or us publish, or, or, or us push that thing. OK, and we don't need that command on the end, or that, that artifact type. So, OK, so what we're going to do is or us push this thing to that URL, that registry, uh, version 0, .0, 0.0, alpha 0. Oops, I spelled or us push wrong. OK, we'll run that again. Spell that ratify package checker. Okay, so now we're using the ORAS command to push that. Just like if we're going to do a Docker push, this is the same kind of command. It just knows how to work with pretty much any generic artifact that you want to push to a registry. And this is running a little slow because I'm on Wi-Fi, but cool, it's, it worked, right? So we have that in the registry now. Um, we could do an ORAS discover on that thing just to see if it's, if it's there. Cool, and then we could do an ORAS pull on that, just like if we're going to pull a Docker container. Same basic principle. Cool, so it downloads that. Now we have ratify package checker. It's good to go. It'll take a second to download. OK, so now let's jump to one more tab real quick. And let's take a look what's in our cluster. So we've got a kind cluster here. We have Gatekeeper. Uh, what's running in that namespace? Uh, we have Gatekeeper already. And we have Ratify running. That's great. So let's tail the logs on Ratify. OK. 
So we've got our ratify instance running. That's great. So what we're going to do now is cancel that download because it's going to take a little bit. And we're going to do kubectl apply package verifier. Cool. It created a new verifier for us in the cluster. And we can see that it is responding to that already. Um, it resolved the manifest for it, and it's downloading the plugin, just like I was doing with ORAS pull. It's going to do the exact same thing um, into the cluster. It might take a little bit of time to download because the download speed is not great on this Wi-Fi connection. So let me just switch uh, kubectl context back to a different cluster, just to demo magic here. We're going to switch back to our kubecon demo cluster. And here, we're going to look in that directory and we'll see, hey, all of our, our things are there. So that's great. Um, what we're going to do now is uh, check that. Let's get the, the verifiers. And cool, we see our, our, not our notary verifier, which is the default one, is there. And then our new package checker one is there as well. Perfect. So we should be able to run an image, our image, and see if it validates that or not. So let's do that. Back to this project. We're going to run this command right here, kubectl demo, and we're going to run that image that we built and published as part of our build pipeline. Okay, so clear that out. Okay, so kubectl run. Uh, we're going to name it demo, and then again, the same image we've been talking about through this workflow. And when I run that, you can take a look at the logs and see what's happening in the ratify pod. Oh, it, it worked. <laughs> ah, it failed to download the plugin because it's trying to re-download it because the Wi-Fi is, uh, is too slow in here. So, boo, that failed. Um, we can see that it is trying to use the plugin to pull, uh, using that verifier config to pull the plugin down, store it inside of the, the Ratify pod that's running, and then use that verifier to admit the, or deny the, the workload. In this case, because it failed to download the plugin, it wasn't able to apply the plugin, and it didn't fail for us. But um, let's see if the other cluster had that. Same problem. OK. Let's get our pods again. Okay, I think uh, it's still downloading. That's a bummer. Okay, so if we try to run this again, I think we'll see the same behavior. It's gonna allow it. Oh, no, there we go. Oh, we have a different policy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, that's, uh, that's unexpected. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's back, take a step back and look at the, the config real quick. Uh, you can see that's still downloading. It's a bummer. Okay, so in VS Code again, um, the verifier result is going to either return false for is successful, and then the list of error messages that we expect to see come back. So disallowed licenses, disallowed package versions, if it matches any of those things. Otherwise, it's going to successfully validate things and return those back in. Um, the configuration itself, again, uh, we're going to use that OCI artifact that we pushed to the registry. That, we can see it pulling it and downloading that inside of the, um, the, the, the ratify pod itself. Um, and then the configuration that we want to pass into it. So you can write pretty complicated things here. If you needed to combine different things, you could, uh, you could actually compose um, those plugins together to, to make different things. But I think the really interesting thing is you can make multiple verifiers. So as policies of our needs evolve and as uh, compliance requirements evolve and change, you'd be able to, write, to either consume existing um, verifiers and add them into your configuration and evolve that as necessary or write things to satisfy your own business needs um, as you go through things. Okay, I'll jump back to my slides real quick because I've got one thing of notes that you can take a look at. All right. 
So what we, um, what we saw today uh, were a few things from Gatekeeper. So I've included some links to that Gatekeeper documentation. Um, also a link to the, uh, the image spec in OCI. So if you're interested in learning more about what's changing in the OCI 1.1 spec, you can take a look at things there. Um, if you're interested in writing your own plugins for Ratify, there's a great link to some documentation here. I used um, Azure Container Registry for most of this demo, but you could totally use uh, another CNCF project called Zot. Um, Zot has implemented the OCI 1.1 spec, and they were like super quick about updating it. So as new RCs come out for the, uh, the OCI 1.1 spec, um, they're implementing that, and you can totally take advantage of all of these great new um, capabilities that are in the OCI spec. Um, finally, I use uh, the ORAS CLI tool, so if you want to take a look at that, you can go to oras.land, and it'll give you all the cool information about that. Um, and then if you want to take a look at my demo, uh, I uploaded it to GitHub, so um, github.com slash my name slash ratify package checker, and you can download the source and check it out there. Cool. Uh, if you want to rate this session, please do so. There is a QR code here that you can scan, you can provide feedback and be greatly appreciated. And uh, thanks to our sponsors for recording this and sending it out. And thank you for attending. Um, I think we're out of time, so I'll stay over here if you have questions you want to come over and ask anything. Uh, feel free to ping uh, into the, um, the, the channel in the CNCF Slack as well if you want to have any kind of discussion there later on. Just feel free to at me, um, at my name, or Jeremy Rickard, and then I'll, uh, I'll see your message, and then we can continue the conversation.